It was from here, Weybridge, Surrey, that a Victorian gentleman, J.B. Dashwood, began an epic boat trip. His aim was to reach Portsmouth in four or five days, in time to see the 1867 Spithead Review. Today he would have to sail down the Thames to London and around the coast to Portsmouth. But in the 1860s, Mr Dashwood had another option, the much more direct Surrey and Sussex canal system. London's lost route to the sea. His plan was to follow the River Way from its junction with the Thames at Weybridge to south of Guildford, where he would enter the Way and Arran Canal. This would take him right through the heart of Surrey, eventually linking with the River Arran in Sussex. He could then follow the river, past Arundel, and join the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal to get him to Chichester Harbour, from where he would sail in safety to Portsmouth. That was the plan. The historic town of Guildford, with the River Way running through its centre at Town Bridge, is about 15 miles south of Weybridge by water. Guildford is where we pick up J.B. Dashwood's route to Portsmouth. His journey from Weybridge to here was quite straightforward, as indeed it is today. However, in 1867, the Surrey and Sussex Canal system was on its last legs, and from here on in, he faced a few problems. I suspect, as I go to explore the route myself, I may well find a few of my own. The first task was to find the right kind of vessel which would also accommodate my discerning travelling companion, Rowan. Frog provided the solution. A 7 foot 10 folding plywood dinghy, powered by a Minn Kota 30 amp electric outboard. And so, equipped with a fully charged battery, a pair of oars and paddles, the three of us set off in the wake of JB Dashwood. Dashwood's route was to follow the Godalming navigation south from Guildford for about two miles. At Stonebridge, he would then join the Way and Arran Junction Canal and work his way down towards Cranley. We were up at seven, and after a good breakfast, we commenced foraging for supplies. And having procured some meat pies, we need not pause to think of what composed, we slipped our cable and glided under the old bridge on our outward journey. The inhabitants appeared to take great interest in our proceedings, for the bridge was crowded with spectators, and the little gamma of Guildford ran along the towing path after us for a long distance. Just over a mile from the centre of Guildford, we arrive at St Catherine's Lock. These days there are no lock keepers on the river way. They're all self-operated. The navigation and locks are looked after by the National Trust, which maintains them for the benefit of everyone. Footpaths are part of our waterways too. To work the lock, you need a metal handle called a windlass. Before that, however, raw muscle power is what's required to close the bottom gates. It's all right for some. With the gates now closed at both ends, we can use the windlass to open the upper sluices. Sluice gates, or paddles, regulate the flow of water into the lock, allowing the water level to rise under control. A simple but effective system. 
The weir allows excess water to flow safely around the lock, while maintaining the level in the next stretch of the river, or pound. And when the water in the lock has risen to the upper level, the gates can be opened. If you're impatient and try too soon, you'll never move them. Pressing on with our journey, it's strange to think that this spot has changed very little since J.B. Dashwood passed through some 140 years ago. It was here, just above the lock, in this pound, that Dashwood encountered his first real problem of the day, a water shortage. The reason for this was that the pound had been drained so that some work could be carried out on the mill just around the corner. While they were waiting for the lock keeper to let down some more water, a rather more interesting problem occurred. At this juncture, a large herd of formidable looking oxen, having drawn themselves up in line, charged down upon us with lowered heads and tails erect threatening us with instant annihilation. The animals, however, on reaching the bank of our almost dried up canal, seemed to be as much astonished as we were at finding it empty. And after snorting at us for some time, as if chaffing at us in our ridiculous position, turned tail and charged back again to the other end of the field. Eventually, after a sum of money had changed hands, the lock keeper was able to raise the river's water level and Dashwood was able to continue his journey towards the sea. Less than a mile upstream of St Catherine's Lock is the village of Shelford, where the A248 Dorking to Godalming Road crosses the river at Broadford Bridge, the lowest on the navigation. Just beyond the bridge is Stonebridge Wharf, its brick frontage suggesting busier times. A hundred and forty years ago, this site would have handled river cargoes in excess of 500 tonnes a year. Today, the wharf lies derelict, though not completely forgotten. In its heyday, Stonebridge was noted for a particularly dangerous cargo. Gunpowder. That was the dangerous cargo that was shipped from here, Stonebridge Wharf, down the way in the Thames to the magazines in Essex. Just how dangerous was shown in 1864 when one of the barges blew up about a mile downstream, killing the two crew. It's said the explosion was heard as far away as Pallingham Quay in Sussex, some 16 miles to the south. This gunpowder store has been preserved to remind us of Stonebridge Wharf's industrial heritage. Notice that the warehouse is resting on staddle stones to raise the building and keep it as dry as possible, for obvious reasons. I was shown around by Glenis Crocker, an industrial historian who has studied the local gunpowder industry. How did Stonebridge Wharf fit into the overall gunpowder industry locally? It was about two miles from the, the works and the gunpowder was brought here by wagon, then loaded onto the barges, and it was taken to Barking Creek, where the company had its main magazine, and then it was distributed to customers from that magazine on the Thames. What would Dashwood have seen when he passed by here? He may, if he was lucky, have seen a gunpowder cargo being loaded, but it, it only happened about twice a month, so it, it's probably unlikely that he did see that. Immediately south of Stonebridge Wharf is the entrance to the Way and Arran Canal, shown on this 1869 Ordnance Survey map. We're now approaching our first junction. The Godalming navigation continuing straight on, the Way and Arran Canal branching off to the left. And that is where we're heading, 
the canal route taking us down through the Surrey and Sussex countryside before we join the River Arran, 23 miles away. The junction is known as Gun's Mouth, another reminder of Stonebridge Wharf's gunpowder days. When Dashwood passed through, he might have seen barges moored here instead of pleasure boats. <laughs> 